Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast, focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, for episode 111, I've got another incredible episode with my good friend Bitstein, also known as Michael Goldstein, talking about some key articles and thought in Bitcoin from the Nakamoto Institute. I noticed that a lot of newer Bitcoin articles are watered down takes, and there's probably a bunch of newer Bitcoiners who would really benefit from exposure to some of these articles. Michael drops so much incredible knowledge and insight in this episode on a range of topics from Austrian economics and why we hold money to the cargo cultism of altcoins and so much more. Dear listener, you are in for a massive treat. But first, let me introduce the sponsors of the show. So my podcast is brought to you by Kraken, one of the leading and world's longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They're consistently rated the best. They've got an incredibly strong focus on security and acting ethically in the space. They've got high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken have 24-7 support and on the institutional and business solution side, they are providing best-in-class accounting, reconciliation and reporting services for cryptocurrency hedge funds, asset managers and fund administrators. Kraken have an OTC desk for large block trades. They also offer five fiat currencies and also offer margin and futures trading. So to learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. This podcast is also brought to you by Unchained Capital. They are a Bitcoin financial services company offering a two of three keys multi-signature vault and also a Bitcoin collateralized loan. So for the vault, you can use Trezor or Ledger. There's a web interface. It's a very easy walkthrough experience and this can help you distribute your keys. And on the loan side, you can get Bitcoin collateralized loans, so you can get USD without selling your Bitcoins, meaning you don't trigger a capital gains event. And while that loan is outstanding, your Bitcoin is stored in a dedicated multi-signature address under collaborative custody with Unchained. So to learn more and sign up, go to unchained-capital.com. There is a link in the show notes. So on to the interview. Michael, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's so good to be back. Very it's honored. been a long time since I've had you on, although we should admit to the listeners, there was the Lost Tapes episode that we had and we never released that one, but uh, we've got you back now. So yeah, <laughs> welcome yeah. back. So- I still have a long way to go before I reach uh, VJ level uh, appearances <laughs> on, this, on the <laughs> Stefan Levera podcast. So, so look, this puts you up to number two. Uh, VJ is currently on four. Pierre is on three. So we'll see how we go. I might get Pierre back on for another episode soon as well. Um, but yeah, look, let's look. What I was hoping to get to today is the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute crash course and the literature and just how the website came together. Because in my view, there is a lot of really high quality material on this website that a lot of newbies to Bitcoin have not necessarily read because they're reading some of the articles that are coming out nowadays, which are in some sense downstream of much of this very formational formation uh what's the word foundational material that is uh on the nakamoto institute so do you want to just give us a bit of an overview what was your aim in setting up the satoshi nakamoto institute and setting up the mempool which is kind of like a blog series and then the crash course yeah so um i guess it, it all starts you know back when we all got interested in bitcoin at the university of texas uh, back in late 2012 and in early third 2013, um, in that time period, um, I, I guess it was early 2012, I had started the Mises Circle at the University of Texas, which was an Austrian economics reading group. And we'd, we'd read all kinds of stuff from you know, Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe and Hayek and you know, a, a, everyone in between about just all kinds of random topics. It was a very, very eclectic uh, mix of, of readings. Um, but as soon as late 2012 rolled in, um, it quickly became the Bitcoin group. And pretty much every week was uh, touching on uh, Bitcoin-related topics. And because of this, there was a lot of discussion and there were a lot of, um, you know, sort of original economic ideas coming out of the group. Um, and I would say sort of uh, perfected in writing um, by by Daniel Krawitz. Um, and we were posting a lot of articles on the Mises Circle blog. Um, sometime is probably in summer of 2013, um, I met Tur Demister for the first time. He was he was in town for something, and uh, we met at a Bitcoin meetup. And uh, 
within our discussion, we had been joking about how, you know, there's the Mises Institute for Austrian economics. There ought to be a Nakamoto Institute for uh, crypto anarchy. And, uh, you know, sometime in August, I bought the domain and uh, put a couple things up in a really uh, cheap HTML. Like it was literally like the most basic HTML page at the time, just to store some things. But by... Um, November 2013, I sort of started the actual website and started collecting um, literature from uh, the the cypherpunks and crypto anarchists uh, that that Bitcoin kind of came out of, and um, soon after launched the website as people see it now, which also includes um, the public writings of Satoshi, um, so that people can sort of get the the full. Uh, Satoshi experience, so to, so to speak. Um, so uh, part of the reason why this was necessary at the time um, was that there was this... Uh, well, first of all, actually, I mean, the part of the reason was just because I was learning about the crypto anarchists from this sort of hardcore Tim May perspective, um, as opposed to uh, previously my... my um, understanding of the sort of uh, cypherpunks and crypto anarchists were more of the um, Julian Assange types who I who I greatly admire, but um, it's also it's 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 libertarian, but in a very broad sense. And when you come across Tim May, you start to realize that um, there's also a a um, lineage of crypto anarchy um, in the cypherpunks that is um, extremely. Cypher, uh, extremely libertarian in the sort of Austro libertarian and cap um, fashion, and so that obviously greatly appealed to me. And it was it was more than um, I hate to use the word, but more than merely civil liberties. And there was also this this um, understanding of how can you secure property um, and and all of these other libertarian principles, along with the important civil liberties um, using uh, using these uh, cryptographic tools. And um, at the time, this was, in, you know, during Bitcoin's first, you know, kind of foray, foray into the mainstream. Um, there was the 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 bump up to two hundred fifty dollars, and um, over the course of twenty thirteen, we saw it go to a thousand dollars twice. Um, and or I guess the second one may have been twenty fourteen, but in any case, we like we had started to see Bitcoin reach some pretty incredible. Le- uh, you know, price levels, and uh, it was getting a bit more attention, um, especially because of the Silk Road and um, projects like that. And there was an element of wanting to bring Bitcoin into the mainstream uh, banking establishment, uh, but it was it was in a way of you know wanting to bend over for the banks. So it was wanting to sort of say, oh, this is actually friendly to the banks. It was, it was basically inviting them to come in and shape it to their will, um, rather than how it's actually played out um, for good reason. Um, and, and it's a good thing that it played out this way. That's more um, the banking establishment has to adapt to Bitcoin rather than the other way around. But at the time, there was this, there was this feeling among these people that you could push Bitcoin in that direction. Um, you know, we remember all kinds of uh, kerfuffles with the the Bitcoin Foundation and some of these other groups. So, so there was a sort of element of that at the time, and there was also this drive to make it seem like, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin has a, li- a lot of libertarian followers now, uh, but Bitcoin really isn't a a libertarian thing. And in a sense, that's true. In the sense that I think it can appeal to people. Uh, more broad, broadly than merely the hardcore Austro-libertarians. In fact, if that was the case, uh, Bitcoin would be a failed project because it would not gain the liquidity needed to uh, be such the, the, the juggernaut it is today. Um, however, you know, the point that we wanted to make is you know, Bitcoin came out of this ethos, this very libertarian ethos, um, and it, the, even that term, you know, there's there's plenty of quibbles we can we can make about the the exact you know nature of that, but it came out of that, and by design, it is a decentralized protocol that no one person or organization can't control. So it's effectively just by its very nature libertarian, and 
the Nakamoto Institute would exist as a way to continue this um, uh, and, and preserve this intellectual tradition so that no matter what people wanted to believe, there was always that specter haunting of what the real crypto anarchist vision was. Um, and, and that was sort of setting the, the ethos for uh, uh, my website. Fantastic. I love it. And I think that is, to some extent, when people are reading other articles or other books or watching other videos, some of that is almost like watered down material back from these days from, you know, from, and for me coming in, that was around the time I was coming in and I was reading these articles and they were fantastic. And I want to talk through the crash course in particular, because yeah. this is to, to this day, I still believe it's one of the best places that I can point a newbie and say, Hey, read through this series of articles and you will attain a much better understanding of Bitcoin. So tell us a little bit about the crash course and what you were hoping to achieve with that. Sure. So, yeah, so there's a, uh, uh, basically we, we can call it a blog on the Nakamoto Institute called the memory pool, um, the mem pool. And the idea there is, um, stuff that you know uh, we we want to believe is true. We we tend to think that there's a good reason to believe is true. Uh, but of course, it's merely in the memory pool. It's not it's not confirmed in the blockchain yet. Um, although over time, I hope uh, you know we can solidify that, make it immutable. But um, the purpose there is just to to share sort of these sort of additional. Uh, economic insights going forward. So, you know, you mentioned the literature section. You know, that's stuff that's generally speaking up until the uh, publication of the white paper. And then the mempool is the the blog of economic analysis that was uh, looking forward past that. Um, a lot of these articles started off um, on the Mises uh, Circle website. Um, I think you can even go still see them on that website. Um, and they were they were republished on um, the the Nakamoto Institute website um, because I thought they you know they had a lot of value. I mean I think they've held up very well. Um, and uh, since then you know things have been uh, posted to that. As far as the crash course itself, that actually came out of uh, just a totally um, like it was on the the spur of the moment thing. I was I was trying to. Uh, you know, uh, explained Bitcoin's potential for growth and why it's absolutely reasonable to believe that Bitcoin will will take over um, as a global reserve currency to a uh, actually rather prominent no coiner. I won't I won't name names. I, I I do respect the person, but unfortunately, he's a no coiner. Um, and I was trying to explain it, and I was just like, look. Here's the thing. And I was just copying over all of these articles because we had uh, effectively amassed the full story of uh, Bitcoin's uh, path to dominance. And I was sort of doing an annotated uh, bibliography of, of that. I was just saying like, well, uh, here's our thoughts on monetary policy and why Bitcoin uh, not only fits that, but exemplifies that. And, you know, shared a couple of articles on that. And I just went through, I just laid out what we had, not necessarily in publication order, but in a logical order of here's a story from A to Z, from zero to 100 trillion USD, uh, how, how Bitcoin takes over and, and why we believe that to be the case. Um, and so it sort of, it sort of just uh, happened unexpectedly. And I thought that it was a, a, a nice uh way to to view the 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 blog and kind of i walk people through these articles because it is kind of this giant mess um when you just kind of scroll down the the publication so this is a way to walk people through that story and and give it more uh, of a logical structure fantastic i love it and look i think many of my listeners you would really do well to read through the crash course articles I know many of them are actually written in 2013 and 14, but they are, it's like a very timeless series of articles. Let's yeah. talk about a few of them. So uh, let's start with End the Fed, Hoard Bitcoins by Pierre Richard, right? Now, in this article, there's a few comments around the futility of the traditional uh, political libertarian approach of trying to audit the Fed and, you know, trying to push gold and silver adoption. And in this article, Pierre's really making that point that, 
we should instead hoard bitcoins and he and he shows the the flow chart as well do you want to just comment on those yeah so this was the the first bitcoin article to come out of uh the misi circle at, at ut um this came out in february 19th 2013 um but yeah i i think it was very clear from um a, a number of different angles why traditional uh approaches to defeating the dollar hegemony uh hegemony uh was was a fool's errand um one of them was the you know it goes from ron paul chanting end the fed with you know or the supporters chanting end, end the fed to rand paul wanting to maybe kind of audit the fed um and nothing ever happens it doesn't matter how much sort of political lobbying you do they have every reason not to share that information with you, let alone just shut the thing down. Um, and then there's, there's, you know, also, also the fact that in, in many ways, fiat money does represent some improvements on the legacy monetary system uh, by virtue of uh, its transaction costs. Um, that's not to say that it's, it's good because we see what happens to the, the base layer and its, its supply. Um, but it is extremely easy to send uh, uh, fiat to people, uh, generally speaking, at least um, in the United States itself. So, um, and then there was also, you know, alternative methods of trying to fight it, like e-gold and stuff like that, which just gets shut down because it's centralized. And so, it, you simply can't use those a, as methods. And so, it, it becomes clear that you need something else. And Bitcoin is obviously that um that technology right and also there's a flow chart here which shows this very virtuous feedback loop if you will and i think that the over the years there have been many versions of this but i think this is one of the first ones that i saw and essentially it was something like you know user adoption uh, basically all these factors are related together it's like hoarding user adoption higher price media attention mining profitability hashing power security of the network perceived legitimacy did you have any thoughts on that yeah, well, I think this was one of the first great um, sort of visualizations of all of these feedback loops because there's there's very many uh, feedback loops that go into Bitcoin. But um, it is interesting because I do think that this is, uh, it's missing a lot. So it did, uh, this is a good example of how we can learn a lot, um, you know, in, in years prior, we're not, we're not dogmatists. Um, and uh, in this case, you know, something that I think we've learned is, um, there, there's also like, there's no mention of, uh, developers in, in this flow chart. And so, uh, you know, that's actually one of, uh, Trace Mayer's network effects is the, is the developer, um, uh, uh, network effect. And so, you know, if there's, if there's more of a price, it's going to attract more people to it. There's going to be more, you know, that, that security of the network has to happen somehow. Um, and there's also just a coolness factor. Um, that can be kind of separate from a lot of it. Uh, there's there's a lot of other things going on, but I think this was, um, you know, like this. I I don't remember when the post itself was made on Bitcoin Talk, um, where that uh, originated. It was um, it was actually the day before in 2013. Um, but you know, it was it was one of those things where when you look at it, you can't forget it, and yeah. you also it has hoarding at the top. Um, or, you know, uh, on, on the original one, it was long-term investment interest, but you know, we all know what that means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so having hoarding at the top and seeing how everything sort of flows through it really sets the tone for how to understand, uh, Bitcoin's path to dominance. And so I think, I think that was a great thing uh, to have set in your mind in early 2013. Yeah, excellent. I think that's really the way you have to conceive of it. Uh, let's move to the next one, which I wanted to touch on, which is Bitcoin Central Bank's perfect monetary policy. Now, this is a like this is an infamous chart. It's got Bitcoin's asymptotic money supply targeting. So Pierre wrote this one as well, and this one has what I call what I think of as one of the most infamous uh, graphs. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? what Pierre is getting at here. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, and this was written December 15th, 2013. Um, and Saifedean Amus, our friend Saifedean has said that his book is effectively just the book length version of this article um, to, to give people a, a feeling for how uh, influential this has been. Um, 
what Pierre did in this article was take the concept of central banking and say, we're just like Bitcoin is replacing those central banks with a brand new central bank. It's a decentralized one, but it is a central bank. There's a central issuer of the money um, and, and all of that. But um, he, he describes Bitcoin as, as a central bank would describe their money. So he gives a, a fancy term to Bitcoin supply curve, which he calls it asymptotic money supply targeting. And he shares the this infamous graph that I think originated maybe on the Bitcoin wiki, but I'm sure it showed up at Bitcoin Talk first at some point, um, where it just shows the total money supply and it has an asymptotic, you know, to, to a, a horizontal asymptote um, at, at about 21 million. And then the supply growth rate, where you quickly see the, the inflation rate just plummeting uh, year after year, but especially at those halvings um, to the point where it's it's zero um, once you get to a, you know, far far enough into the future. And so this is a good way of like, if you were trying to think of Bitcoin as a central bank uh, issued currency, which conceptually it, it, it kind of is, um, this is how we can think about it. We can think about the, the uh, you know, the, the seniorage, uh, in Bitcoin versus the seniorage in a Federal Reserve note, et cetera, et cetera. And it really makes you appreciate just how much better Bitcoin is um, than the legacy institutions. Excellent. And the other key point I think Pierre makes in this article is that fractional reserve banking cannot develop. Do you want to touch on that point? Yes. So this is a very important point, um, and it's come up many times over the years. So yes, uh, so it, there's been a long-term debate, uh, even among Austrians, about whether or not fractional reserve banking is good or not. Um, and there's actually, he, he mentions how uh, the Chicago School also has um, factions that believe in a 100% reserve um, currency. So this has been a long-standing debate, but then it's like, okay, well, if Bitcoin just takes over, uh, well, we have the de facto winner and so we don't even have to worry about that anymore. We just have the money that works and it happens to be full reserve. Um, now, the thing is, is people often bring up the the idea that, oh, well, you go on an exchange and, you know, Mt. Gox may have been fractional using fractional reserves or, you know, Tether might be this fractional reserve system or you name it. Like someone, someone somewhere is fractionally reserving Bitcoins. The point here is that, yes, that might actually be true, but you're also... Uh, looking at fractional reserve in a particular um, company um, providing financial services rather than the system itself. Whereas when fractional reserve banking happens in dollars, uh, that's that's the money itself. They're not. It's not just Chase Bank um, doing stuff. Everyone is affected by by every instance of fractional reserve banking. So. In this case, like you're opting into certain trust networks, and it's up to you to find the good trust networks, but none of those trust networks can change the chain itself. So as long as you store your own keys, there's nothing that any of these institutions could ever possibly do um, that dilutes your wealth uh, via fractional reserve banking. I suppose just on that point, it might be interesting to discuss. So... Part of what makes the Austrian theory of the business cycle is that these paper claims to money are circulating out in the community and that they are treated as equal to the claims in the bank, right? And so in the Bitcoin world, when you alone hold your keys and you're running your full node, etc., there is that point, I suppose, where someone might argue, oh, but what if Coinbase uh, Bitcoins, which is basically kind of like a Coinbase IOU, right? And let's say some other company, maybe Zappo Bitcoins, I guess what you're getting at there is that those would be treated as different claims, right? A Coinbase IOU is different to a Zappo IOU is different to some other IOU, which again is different to Bitcoin held on your full node with your own private keys, etc. Exactly. Exactly. I think that was uh, very well stated. Let's get on now. So you touched on this earlier, but this is also an infamous article. It's I'm hoarding Bitcoins and no, you can't have any. Now, this is a fantastic article by Daniel Krawis. And I, I think it really speaks to this concept of reservation demand. Did you want to just expand on that? 
Yeah. So, and this was this was written in uh, on February twelfth, two thousand fourteen. Um, basically, the the argument uh, is that what sort of increases liquidity in Bitcoin, what gives Bitcoin value, is the fact that people want to hold on to it. Um, in fact, you can't really have a medium of exchange uh, in the almost in any of the sense unless it's something that people actually demand. Um, so the reason that you can buy a good for indirect trade is because you think that someone will be wanting that thing at the end of the indirect trade. So the more that people actually demand a good and want to hold it, that sort of sets the the lower bounds for um, its its usefulness. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Trace Trace Mayer talks about uh, hodlers of last resort, and that's that's like the the hardcore hodlers setting that ultimate baseline, where it's, it couldn't possibly the price couldn't possibly go lower than a certain uh, level because there there is always that that demand for holding it for whatever reason that might be. So, yeah, the argument is that there needs to be real demand. Uh, to hold to really you know bootstrap this and this this is in this stark contrast to the arguments about uh, spending bitcoins and that you you need to spend bitcoins at a store to really get the get the economy moving or or whatever and it's like yeah you could even convince a merchant to start accepting bitcoin but they might just turn around and sell it. They really just wanted the dollars, and so you haven't created additional liquidity in Bitcoin. You've actually just you've actually decreased liquidity in that case. Um, th there's there's plenty of reasons to want to spend Bitcoins at a Bitcoin only merchant. Um, aside from that, but if your goal is to you know take Bitcoin to the moon, you're not you're not really helping at the margins uh, by doing that. Um, there's also, you know, the fact that if you are willing to give away Bitcoins, you're not signaling to people that this is a thing that they want to hold on to. You know, if you're just, if you're giving away free stuff, people, people kind of assume some, some things. And I'll tell you from personal experience, I stupidly thought that in 2013, you could stand outside and, you know, give out paper wallets or something and that would get people interested in Bitcoin. No one cares. Uh, you you just stand out there and look like a dork. Um, so you know you you have to you have to give people a reason why they would actually want to demand this thing. Um, as we all know, number go up is a very compelling reason for people to want to do that, and it happens to be a a self fulfilling prophecy. Um, finally, um, hoarding has always been used as a term by Keynesians and other economists to um, to to sort of demonize the act of saving because they view that as withholding money from the economy and therefore it's not put to any use. However, when you hold money, um, it is a productive uh, action. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. No one does stuff that they think is, is um, on net negative for them. Um, and you're actually, in a way, investing in the economy. You you take money out uh, that increases the value of every, everyone else's money, and then as more people do that, and that adds up to you know an appreciable increase in the the value of the the money, then suddenly people have enough capital to take on investments that they didn't previously um, have the have the ability to take on. Um, and so they can go out and do that. And if they had a good idea and they they uh, have entrepreneurial profits, then that comes back and that's a increase in the wealth of society. And therefore, your money also has more pur purchasing power because there's just more capital out there for you to purchase with it. So in a sense, like the hoarding is a productive act of hedging against future uncertainty such that you can... Um, there's nothing you want right now, but perhaps in the future there would be. And so far as you're making any money by holding a currency, it is uh, because the economy had grown uh, thanks to this this sort of uh, uh, process writ large. And so uh, it, you are taking on risk and you're getting benefited by having sort of invested in the economy as a whole. So hoarding should not be seen as this 
this evil thing. Uh, you know, we take on the word hoarding because, you know, just like maximalist to toxic or whatever else, you know, we like, we like taking on the, the haters words, but, um, saving should be seen as a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and this is a, this is a great argument against that, that mindset. Excellent articulation. I don't think I could have said it better. And for listeners who want to read more into the background of some of Michael's comments there, I recommend you check out Hans Hermann Hopper. There's a, I think it's a lecture, but you can find it uh, written as an, uh, an article on the Mises website. It's called The Yield from Money Held Reconsidered. And also check out some of Guido Holzman's work around deflation and some of his talks around why hoarding is not so bad. And these are some of the in some sense, our intellectual forefathers who helped us explain and understand this in a more yes. clear way. Which yeah. to bring up, like I, I've said this many times, but uh, Bitcoin maximalism, at least how I espouse it, is literally nothing more than uh, the exact same economics I was espousing prior to Bitcoin, now with uh, new and improved magic internet money. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, I think uh, that, that Hans Hermann Ahapa article, I think I was... I think I was one of the ones who kind of, you know, brought that back because it was one of those things that just like I just remembered having read something back in the day, and you 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 dig up all these classics when you're uh, arguing with no coiners. Um, that is that is the real benefit of no coiners. And uh, but I think that actually came from uh, I, I think that may have been originally or not originally, but it was it was included in uh, the economics and ethics of. Uh, private property, which uh, I also highly recommend uh, just as a whole to Bitcoiners and anyone interested in Austrian economics. You touched on, you made this point earlier about how now we've got this new magic internet money. And part of that is the open source ethos. So that is a good uh, seg into our next one, which is another article from the mempool or the crash course as well. It's called the correct strategy of Bitcoin entrepreneurship. So we're all in this together. What was, what was the point of this article? Yeah, and so uh, for the timestamp, this was May 16th, 2014. Um, the point here is that um, it's something that I've articulated as, you know, if you have a Bitcoin business um, and basically you run into an issue with uh, Bitcoin, um, the problem is likely your business, not Bitcoin. Um, and in a more abstract economic sense, uh, Bitcoin has a better return than pretty much any Bitcoin business you're going to be able to create. Um, and so uh, whether it's technical or economic, businesses are going to run into this issue and have to like contend with that fact. Like, why would I bother to do anything um, if, if I can just, you know, make, yeah, I can just hold the Bitcoins. Um, and the reason is because you actually just want to make your Bitcoins more valuable. The correct strategy of Bitcoin entrepreneurship is to devote um, some of your resources, um, you know, let's say like 10% or something towards making Bitcoin more valuable as a whole. Now, the thing is, is because, uh, because this is a high growth environment um, and because, you know, Bitcoin is so trustless um, and trust minimized and uh, for enemies and all of that, it's, it's imperative that as much be as open source as possible. And so with this, we can think of Bitcoin entrepreneurship not as this, like, um, it's a little in, in contrast with the Peter Thiel um, vision of startups that he lays out in Zero to One, which is viewing startups as a sort of cult um, where you have secret knowledge of something and you're sort of arbitraging on that fact. Um, that you have a deeper understanding of that than everyone else. Now, you could say that that's what we're doing as as a Bitcoin cult, as a group. But you know, it's also important that within that cult, you know, we're sharing uh, these ideas. Um, and so, uh, on the flip side, though, from like that that sort of extreme, just imagine like a single business as that cult. Instead, we have the whole Bitcoin economy as that cult. And um, you actually, just by nature of the economics, you'll make more money uh, just by helping number go up and helping um, helping make it, <laughs> I almost want to say make it help, uh, safer for number to go up, you know, improve cus uh, custodial solutions for yourself and for institutions so that, you know, uh, 
when it does go up, people don't lose their coins um, and and this sort of stuff. Now, he talks about uh, labor being scarcer than ideas. And this is another problem in the Bitcoin and what became sort of the sort of cryptocurrency space where everyone has a lot of ideas and they just want to roll their own thing. Like, let's just create a new money every time. Let's like, I have a new idea. Let me create my own money for it. And it, it's very easy to start coming up with di- these ideas. It's extremely difficult to be able to put the labor in to make them work, uh, especially when the ideas are kind of doomed from the get go with a lot of those. Uh, but that's another story. So the point is, it's like when we look at um, entrepreneurship in the Bitcoin space, um, I look towards uh, you know stuff like BTC Pay Server and um, um, uh, uh, you know things like Trezor or uh, Cold Card, which you know is Bitcoin only, so that that has a major advantage. But um, it, it's these these enterprises where now you know BTC Pay Server is being sponsored by by individuals who are you know I if I want my Bitcoin to be better. So I, that's going to require having a world of BTC pay servers running. It's in my interest to want to help that process along. Um, with Cold Card, I'm sure Rodolfo is actually making, you know, maybe he's making good money selling these devices, but it's also because he's just being, he just happens to be the one that has the hardware um, and, and is selling it. But the knowledge itself is completely open source. And there's actually even a... Um, sort of uh, encouragement, if you can make your own cold card, you should do it. Um, and people are very welcoming of that in the Bitcoin community. Um, so yeah, like uh, you you want to think of Bitcoin as an open source thing in the fullest sense. Um, and in entrepreneurship, this means uh, maybe looking at profits, not so much in in terms of... Uh, the the uh total returns because you're simply like if look like if stock to flow ratio is uh correct for instance like you're not gonna beat you know 10x uh on on your coins now uh through 2021 with some business but um you can think of it in terms of the actual um human and technological capital surrounding bitcoin and how that only makes um that that liquidity even more valuable and you can make it uh you know more usable for more things it's also interesting to understand that not many bitcoin businesses have returned in bitcoin terms they have one they might have profited in fiat terms but not in bitcoin terms right which if you're a future oriented company you're going to be wanting wanting to think in um uh, bitcoin terms um but it also shows uh, why it's important to have, you know, to, to sort of think about, you know, your unit of account and all of that. But the other thing, just in general, I, I think what we've seen is, is a move towards what Daniel uh, was writing about here. And all of the companies that we actually cherish tend towards this open source model. Um, and at the very least, open sourcing uh, a, a, as much as they can, um, except for like core, core business um, ideas that might involve like uh, you know customer secrets and stuff like that, which of course you wouldn't want open source. Um, but as far as like you know uh, storing storing coins um, and stuff like that, uh, the the hardware wallets where you know that knowledge is becoming more open, um, all of these things are becoming more open. Um, and those are also they're, they're the most well respected people, and there's plenty of places to make money in it. Yeah, right. And in the meantime, not anyway. just that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and it's not just that. I think uh, I guess the way Daniel expresses it in this article as well as he's saying it's not that much about making the direct profit. It's more about turning bitcoins into money, right? Yes, that is that is a much more succinct way of describing the article than all the rambling I just did. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I think it's it's very useful context uh, for the listeners as well. Yeah, uh, and excellent summary. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about altcoins now. So there's a few articles in the um, crash course talking about basically shitcoins. So there's the problem with altcoins, the coming demise of altcoins. Uh, what what are we getting at here? Are they are they basically just cargo cults? Are they not recognizing that liquidity is king? Correct. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> so uh, basically, um, 
this was coming out. So let's see. The problem with altcoins was written in August 22nd, 2013. Um, so this was... Uh, this was after the first, actually, I, I, I get, I, I, I lose track of the, the history at this point. I need to go back, but I think this is about, you know, uh, the beginning of the sort of Scambrian explosion as I've, I've called it. <laughs> um, I think 2014 was the real, the real, uh, uh, move into that, but we were starting to see, you know, Litecoin gaining prominence again. Um, there was, uh, PP coin. Um, which I forget what that later became, uh, Pure Coin, I believe. I think they realized that PP Coin uh, was not exactly the best branding for, <laughs> for something. There was a Prime Coin, Aurora Coin, like you, you name it. There was all these different, there's all these different coins that were coming out, and for the most part, a lot of them, you'd go on Bitcoin Talk, and there would be a announcement thread. And it would basically be a template where someone would say, oh, well, this coin, uh, it has this logo, it has this name, it uses this hash, um, it uses, it has this many coins and this block time. And everyone was just differentiating it, each other based on those same variables, which in a sense, none of those matter. Like a lot of those are um, either arbitrary in Bitcoin or Bitcoin uh, whether purposefully or not, sort of optimized for a given uh, thing. Like 21 million, uh, I, I forget the details on, on how Satoshi picked that, but it was, for the most part, it was just like a random number. Um, it was 50 over that, geom like it starts at 50 and goes through that geometric series and you end up with 21 million. Um, it could have been something else. It really doesn't matter. As, as Rothbard talks about, any quantity of money um, is suitable for an economy. We could have one Bitcoin um, as long as we have that way of you know, dividing it into more. Um, it would be fine. In fact, you could think of the 21 million as one conceptually. It would just be different in the code. It would have different numbers. It doesn't matter. Um, the hash... The hashing, it only matters insofar as uh, the reliability of that security. Um, you know, do, do we expect do we expect it to break or, uh, you know, stuff like that? Block times, you know, uh, 10, 10 minutes was good because, you know, light needs to travel around the world and you don't want orphan blocks. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Could nine be better? Is nine... Is nine really going to make a difference? And the point is, it's like, no, this is all just cargo cultism. It's taking the the shell of what Bitcoin is and trying to just slap a different branding on it and throw it out there and somehow think that that's going to do just as well when it's missing these sort of key elements of what Bitcoin is, which is money and creating the network effects of money. Um, his, his other article was... Uh, the coming demise of, of the altcoins. And that came up out in March 14th, 2014. Um, I think this was sort of in the height of the Scambrian explosion. This, this was really driving home the arguments about liquidity, which is you can put out any feature you want. This is, uh, Ethereum was being talked about at this point. Um, and, uh, I, 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 yeah, so Ethereum was being talked about and, yeah, like these features of smart contracts can be very good for attracting a certain kind of investor, but they don't necessarily create liquidity. Um, and like with, there was, like I mean, how many episodes are you up to now? By now, your listeners I think are well aware of uh, various ideas around this, um, but it was driving home the the need to have, uh, you know, a saleable good in order to be trading it as money. And a lot of the other arguments around network effects just did not hold up very well. Um, and th that alone, you know, it, it shows us uh, when, we, when we think about liquidity and, and network effects, the, the competition between them is not sort of this, uh, it, 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 it's almost zero sum in the sense that, and it's, it's also exponential in the sense that, um, as as a person leaves one monetary network and goes to the other, the the one they just went to grew exponentially, and the one that they left shrunk exponentially. And so this is a very a very uh, non linear competition. And on top of that, there's no reason to actually believe that there's any sort of equilibrium between two free market currencies. Um, and so 
trying to determine where that equilibrium would be is is uh, it's just ridiculous, and you might as well treat it as uh, 100%. In reality, it might be like 80% or something, but all, all of those extra, you know, uh, shit coins in the in the fat tails of monetary networks that's just like they're gonna come and go and whatever it doesn't matter what matters is what is that one that dominates the power laws of monetary competition yeah i don't think i could really say much to add to that really uh well one thing to add to that is these discussions uh so the vitalik buterin had had a uh response in bitcoin magazine to uh the first article and this article the second one the coming demise article had uh responses to vitalik's responses so just rebutting uh vitalik's response and uh it was kind of around this that uh vitalik and, and company uh started using the term bitcoin maximalist uh as as a straw man saying that we wanted uh all of of these ideas to be put on the the bitcoin Bitcoin blockchain only uh, when it was more like, no, we just expect all of the money to be on the Bitcoin blockchain only. And, you know, who cares about the rest? I mean, maybe someone will figure out a way to tie it to Bitcoin. Maybe it'll just maybe it's not even necessary. Uh, Maybe there's some other method. But as far as money goes, Bitcoin will have everything. Fantastic. Yeah, I think there were just too many. There have just been too many charlatans over the years selling you selling people this kind of false hope of oh buy this thing and it might be you know it, it does more than bitcoin you see yeah, yeah. my my shitcoin does no you know money and some other random other thing so why wouldn't my thing be more valuable this is something that i like about trace mirrors uh seven network effects because it kind of gives you a whole a whole tally it's like okay well you kind of perhaps you have an edge on this network effect but what about these other six? You're you're totally getting wrecked on those other six. So you're really not special. You gotta you gotta be killing it on all of them to really you know want to catch my attention. Excellent. And I think we could also express it like the Hodler network effect is probably the strongest one out of all of them, right? Yes, I think it sort of gives birth to the other ones because it it gives reason to be looking at the other ones. Like what a, a developer. Uh, it would almost seem like a waste of time if you were working on something that no one cares about. Um, and it would be weird for a merchant to be, you know, a payments network to be using a money that no one touches. What would be the point exactly. of incorporating that? So, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. So, look, let's proceed on now. So there was some discussion, and I remember during those days, there was always a lot of conversation around, oh, Bitcoin's got a bad image problem. Oh, no, it's used by the drug dealers and terrorists and money launderers and you name it, right? Anything bad, it was a Bitcoin. That was, you know, these are the people who use Bitcoin. And then to counter that, there's this article, Bitcoin has no image problem. So uh, what are we getting at here? Yeah, well, so, yeah, so... (laughs) It's supposed to be bad because all the you know drug lords are getting into Bitcoin. Uh, this was written February twenty fifth, two thousand fourteen. Um, honestly, it was the Silk Road that got me that that sort of piqued my interest in Bitcoin and made it sort of uh, a, a real thing. And that's coming from someone who I, I don't do drugs, I don't condone drug use, um, but I can't help but like libertarian you know free markets. And so seeing the Silk Road actually excited me. So. How could that possibly be a problem for its image when it was the thing that was bringing me in into Bitcoin in the first place? Um, if it was just you know another PayPal, like cool, it's an app I can download. That's not that's not special. Um, what's special is that you have a a good that's so interesting that people are willing to commit crime to get their hands on it. <laughs> You know, it's like, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Like, what crime would you commit just to get your hands on another Bitcoin? That's a that's an exciting <laughs> proposition, and everyone should take note. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad that it's mostly peaceful people uh, acquiring Bitcoins. Um, but that is that is a mindset to to consider. Um, and we just look at th- this was one of the first, you know, the the meme didn't exist yet, but this is one of the first, you know, number go up arguments, which is, yeah, that's very nice of you to think that Bitcoin has an image problem and somehow uh, the 
the drug markets will keep people away, which, uh, uh, by the way, I mean, right a couple months before this, uh, the Silk Road had been taken down and Bitcoin was reaching all, all time highs, showing that the Silk Road was not as vital as they thought. But it's like, you know, you're, you're saying all these negative image problems, but it's been up 500 times in two years. So I, 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 first of all, it's not stopping anyone from adopting Bitcoin and it, it's not going to stop me from adopting Bitcoin. So um it's just it's just not a good empirical argument at all. It's usually just um, you know this was people like Jeremy Allaire who wanted to um, bend over to banking regulators uh, rather than adopt to uh, Bitcoiners. Right, and as I think I might have mentioned this on the podcast with uh, guests like VJ before as well, but this idea of the payment system of Bitcoin and that's the significance of that really it only matters after lots of people already have it uh they and and so he's saying i think he's saying here that as well the benefit is marginal to most people of having a payment system especially back in those days yeah and finally i would argue that if you were worried that bad people are going to get their hands on bitcoin then it is your moral duty as a good person to get your hands on as many bitcoins as possible to keep it out of the hands of bad people <laughs> everyone do your part buy bitcoin I, I'm a Bitcoin hodler. I'm on a moral crusade. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Now, so ne- let's move on. So there was this whole argument of, oh, the government is going to shut down Bitcoin. And perhaps in response to that, there's this article, Bitcoin's Shroud of Subtlety and Allure, where there's this discussion on the point of principal agent problem. So what's going on there? Yeah. So this was written in June of 2014. And... Yeah, people people will say the government will shut down Bitcoin and they'll just say it without giving a real explanation of how that will go about. Um, you know, what how will the government shut it down? You know, and you'll get everything from, you know, something about the exchanges to like the real paranoid type saying like, "Oh, an EMP attack." And it's like, well, that's <laughs> I don't think the government's going to do that to themselves. Um but, you know, there's this whole spectrum of just sort of paranoia around the government shutting it down. Um, and this article was, you know, giving an alternative perspective um, that I think is is very much worth thinking about, which is in order to attack Bitcoin, you need to know what Bitcoin is capable of doing. You know, if Bitcoin is just some like, you know, toy thing that causes a nuisance in the drug markets, I mean, it's hard to find the need to go destroy it, especially when traditional uh, criminal investigation um, is able to do what you want to do as the government. Um, if you, if as far as like shut it down because it's a competition to the U.S. dollar, even today the government does not view it that way. You know, we had the Fed chairman himself say, "Oh, well, Bitcoin's more like gold. It's like a store of value thing. It's not. It's not really a money." Um, which of course is funny from our perspective, but um, they don't view it like that. It would take someone to actually have read the crash course and come to this full understanding of what Bitcoin is capable of to be like, hmm, maybe we really do need to stop this thing before it takes away our um, government, you know, faucet uh, that that you know gives us, you know, all the all the ability to expand the warfare and welfare state. However. There's also this problem of the government is not just this one large entity. The government is made up of many organizations. And in those organizations, it is made up of many individuals. All of those organizations and all of the individuals within them have their own personal needs and desires. And this brings up the principal agent problem, which is how do you get an individual in the government to be operating in a way that actually benefits the organization as a whole? Um, and this is this is at multiple levels because you know we can think of some government uh, organizations as some sometimes going rogue, and so you can't even rely on a a particular inst- organization within the government to be in line with the government, and then down on to the individual. So if someone is able to come up with the idea that Bitcoin can take over everything, it's like oh we're going to like you know a million dollars a coin or whatever. Well, you have to sit there as like okay well. I could be investing in that. (laughs) And so I, as the individual, have actually an interest. If I understand that this is the case, why don't I get in on this? And the more you get in on it, the less you're going to want to destroy it. And so this principal agent problem is that, no, 
you know, the government will all just be a bunch of Bitcoiners because they'll they'll just submit to the fact that number go up and what it means for them. If I worked in the government and if I was talking to a government employee, you know, just a regular guy that worked in the government, I would explain to them, it was like, look, do you really think you're going to get your pension? I don't know. But do you think number going to go up? Yes. So <laughs> there's your pension. Um, and <laughs> they're going to have much more loyalty to a decentralized um, perfect central bank um, than to our own central bank uh, here in the United States. Excellent. I love the ex- explanation. Let's talk about your infamous article, Everyone's a Scammer. So you're telling people here, look, everyone, literally, even yourself, you yourself are a scammer. How does that work? So this this is the full culmination of appreciating that Bitcoin is going to happen. Hyper-Bitcoinization is imminent and you must prepare. Now, if it's imminent, then you have to reckon with the fact there are only 21 million Bitcoins. And if you send them somewhere, there's no guarantee you will get them back. There's no guarantee that the price will be down uh, long enough for you to recover that amount of Bitcoins denominated in Bitcoins. Um, therefore, you should be hodling with a, with a vengeance and you should be extremely careful um, when listening to anyone um, trying to pitch you on a reason why you should part with your Bitcoins. This could be for... Um, <laughs> everything from like a, a seemingly charitable reason, you know, um, you know, donating somewhere that, you know, perhaps you don't fully, you know, appreciate enough to want to give up that much of your future opportunity cost um, to um, <laughs> straight up Ponzi schemes where there is a vanity address one Ponzi uh, that will <laughs> send you back more money if you just send it some money. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of explicit scams out there. Um, additionally, people who are trying to get you to spend bitcoins um, are trying to scam you out of, uh, out of out of your money. And here, it's not saying that it's bad to spend money ever. It's not saying that uh, uh, it's it, what it's really saying is that you should be thinking carefully about how much you actually value the things you're acquiring compared to your future potential. Um, wealth given that you hold on to a number of bitcoins that's the real thing it's it's encouraging people to think in a more low time preference way that means if really all you want in life is a lambo you should go buy a lambo but if you have any sense that there's more to life that you want you should consider the the future uh bitcoin economy when making that decision about whether you should buy that lambo now later or ever um there's also uh, all of the altcoin scams where it's just, you know, I, I mentioned Ethereum in there and I have to give Ethereum credit for existing um, because at the time it was not even clear that it would actually exist. Now, it exists today, but f- from an outsider's perspective, it continues to look like a mess and I'm still not sure if it was it was a good investment Um it, to me, it seems like it's it's sort of doomed as an investment still. Now, this doesn't mean that people don't make money in the short term, um, but when we're thinking in terms of, you know, the long term Bitcoin economy, you have to think of Ethereum not only in terms of or any altcoin, not only in terms of its USD price, which has gone up or even it's uh you know bitcoin price which we have seen periods where uh they have had a significant increase but that long term uh bitcoin price um which when you really look at all of the altcoins they all have like the the big spike up and then just like fizzle out to the end and maybe occasionally you'll get another ripple pump um but it kind of goes through that cycle and there has never been um as far as i can see a a alternative uh, currency, whether uh, you know the the um, shit coins or the shit coin of shit coins, the dollar. Uh, that's actually the worst performing, <laughs> I'd say. But um, they they never show any other pattern, generally speaking. And so, uh, when thinking about the long term, do you really want to risk it on trading, or do you just want to like focus on the future? Right. 
And I think there are other ways to think of this as well, explain it. I think uh, Matt O'Dell talks about it, like anything other than Bitcoin trends to, you know, trends down in terms, in Bitcoin terms. I can't remember the exact uh, phrasing he uses. But yeah, so look, I think there are some of the key ones. Obviously, there's many. I, I highly recommend listeners, if you haven't read through the series, definitely go and do that. And then let's now touch on some of the literature. Now, I've got a few favorites from here. So obviously, the Bitcoin white paper itself, reading some of the predecessors, things like B-Money, Hashcash, BitGold, uh, and also some of my favorites from the literature are Nick Zabo's articles, Shelling Out, and Money, Blockchains, and Social Scalability. Have you got any favorites from uh, that list? Oh, I, I love all my babies. Um, no, so, well, the literature, uh, for, more, for more context, so um, it includes the Bitcoin white paper, um, the, the articles that were, and, and books that were referenced in the Bitcoin white paper, and then other works from the cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, um, the Austrian school, and uh, some other sources that kind of play into this, this, this narrative. Um, and um, I really like all of, uh, Nick Zabo was one of the best finds. Um, he was not very popular back um, in 2013, um, when I when I was reading into him, um, I, I first really got into him because I was finding his um, his his work through the contract page on the Bitcoin Wiki. People were talking a lot about on chain contracts such as payment channels and uh, escrow and stuff like that. And uh, you start to learn about smart contracts, uh, which Bitcoin is still the the greatest, you know. Uh, illustration of a, a smart contract, the best implementation of a smart contract. Um, I, and uh, I started just, I, I went down the rabbit hole of his website and um, he is certainly one of the um, greatest uh, public intellectuals in, in the world today, I think. Um, so all of his stuff is fantastic. I, of course, recommend uh, Timothy May's uh, seminal essays, uh, you know, the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, um, crypto anarchy and virtual communities is a an often overlooked one, uh, but it's a very powerful uh, essay looking into how um, communities arise in cyberspace and how they route around various uh, censorship. And I think that's something that's um, especially useful to understand today as we're seeing a lot of deplatforming. Um, this is something that Timothy May could have easily expected. Um, and... Uh, he he also shows sort of a path forward for people who want to be able to convene on, on, online um, despite others not wanting them to. Um, Hal Finney has a lot of great articles. Um, and uh, oh, there's just so much. I don't know if I could touch on everything, but uh, I highly recommend going through that and uh, just kind of seeing what catches your eye. Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's it, it would take a very, very long time to go through and read everything. But uh, I think it's one of those things where if you want to understand Bitcoin, you sort of need to understand where it came from. And many of these articles help articulate that pathway along which things were developed and how Bitcoin came to be what it is today. Yeah, it's also a good uh, argument against the claims that, oh, well, there will be a Facebook to Bitcoin's MySpace. Not understanding that this is a a rich intellectual tradition um, that Bitcoin is building upon, and I think best um, succeeding at. You know, it's it's actually changes the entire landscape um, compared to what a lot of the uh, cypherpunks were imagining. They still imagined uh, centralized banking institutions, and Bitcoin totally uh, obviates that. And so we're actually living in a world that's something I think better than what the cypherpunks could have wanted at the time. Um, uh, not, not in all dimensions, but certainly in the monetary dimension. And, um, because of that, you really have to take it in context and Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the culmination as I see it rather than, um, simply a first iteration. Excellent. Uh, look, uh, I could, I'm sure I could keep talking for hours, but uh, I want to try and keep this uh, digestible for the listeners. So let's um, call that a, an episode. But uh, it's a good way to get me up to episode three and four. Yes, that's right. That's right. We'll keep some, keep, we'll hold some back. So uh, you've got a chance to beat VJ in the uh, all time SLP uh, guest numbers. Um, <laughs> the, the great um, Aussie Texan feud continues. <laughs>
<laughs> That's right. Um, but yeah, so look, listeners, check this stuff out. Go to nakamotoinstitute.org. Michael, do you want to just tell them any, anything else about where they can find you or um, any other things they should yeah, check out? Yeah, of course. Uh, fo- follow me on Twitter at, at, at Bitstein, B-I-T-S-T-E-I-N. Um, the crash course, uh, there's a there's a link on the, the homepage of the Nakamoto Institute, but it's otherwise Nakamoto, nakamotoinstitute.org slash crash course with a, uh, a dash in between or a hyphen. And uh, also check out the literature page, which is just that slash literature. Um, and uh, my DMs are open. Uh, check out the Noted podcast um, at noted.org. And uh, yeah, keep in touch. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. How awesome was that episode? Make sure you share this episode with your friends who are new to Bitcoin so they can think it through a little more clearly and they too may be inspired to go read the Nakamoto Institute Crash Course. Remember, stefanlevera.com is the website to subscribe on your podcast app, get the show notes or the transcripts. Thanks for listening and see you in the Citadels.